My name is Ben Negron. I'm glad to see you here. Uh, have any of you, and you can just uh, either shout it out or just drop it into the uh, into the chat. Have any of you used the Power Hour before? And if so, what what did you uh, what was it for? And I'll just take a look at the chats here. Yes, budgeting. Okay, thank you, Bridget. Appreciate it. And that, uh, yes, I try to catch it every month. Nice. Thank you, Sheila and Dana. Welcome, Dana. Welcome. It's your first time. And Renee, you did your own. So, so very, very nice. Uh, it's a kind of a fast-paced uh, power hour, and uh, so we'll go ahead and get started uh, right now. Uh, let me just um, let you know a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Ben Negron. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Adrian, Michigan, or Lenawee County. Have been very active in a variety of different uh, efforts, uh, mostly related to uh, social injustice uh, and advocacy. Uh, my parents are missionary pastors, have been for all of my life. We've lived in a lot of different countries. And I'm trying to do in a secular way what my parents have done in a spiritual way through their church ministry since 1978 here in the city of Adrian. I'm the founder and uh, executive director of OLA, which is uh, Hispanics of Lenaway Alliance. Uh, we, have, uh, we have been involved in our mission uh, uh, to positively impact many lives and organizations throughout Lenaway County. Uh, one of our uh, big uh, proud moments was to uh, have been selected uh, by the Aden Public School System uh, several years ago as the organization to provide translation services for the 19% uh, Hispanic demographic here in the city of Adrian. Parents who maybe didn't uh, speak English very well, maybe their children did. And so we provided uh, volunteers free of charge to sit there in the classroom and help um, English speaking um, uh, teachers and Spanish speaking parents be able to kind of connect and understand what um, Johnny or Jill needed to improve on in their uh, academics at, at the uh, middle school uh, and high school levels. I'm also um, a trustee at the Santa Heights University uh, uh, Board of Trustees, uh, one of the most um, well-known uh, private uh, Midwestern uh, uh, colleges with a massive diversity among its demographics and population there. So I had a couple of options to choose and I chose the one that I felt was uh, best suited to help me to continue in the uh, area of diversity, equality and uh, inclusion. I'm also a um, member of the leadership team at Meyer Incorporated uh, of the Mosaic Group. Uh, there's about 11 of us that help guide the organization in its DEI uh, um, efforts and initiatives and uh, enjoy an opportunity to meet a great number of people in all of the, what we call TMRGs, team member resource groups. So that's everything from LGBT to our disabled and our veterans and everything in between. And finally, I am a uh, authorized Google instructor for the Applied Digital Skills curriculum. Uh, it's something that I offer for free for anybody that wants to learn all of the wide array of Google products and have been doing that uh, with my organization Train Lenaway here in the city of Adrian. Uh, since December 14 of last year. I am not, I am not a social psychologist. I'm not uh, a teacher. I'm not, um, you know, an expert in this field. I will tell you that I've spent uh, three or four years honing my skills in this area uh, academically uh, through a variety of different uh, institutions, including University of Illinois and the University of Michigan. Uh, through their certificate programs. The great majority of my experience, uh, so that I'm fully transparent, comes through lived experiences, uh, through what I've lived through, through what my parents have lived through, through what our church organization has lived through, through what friends and family have lived through. Uh, and you know, when I put all of that stuff together, I feel like 
Um, I've been given an opportunity to help others understand uh, all the issues associated with diversity, inclusion, and equality uh, in our communities. Uh, so I am married. Uh, I married my sixth grade sweetheart, uh, Connie. Uh, we met in sixth grade. We didn't start dating until uh, 12th grade. Uh, we were friends throughout that whole time. Uh, each of us had different, you know, avenues in life. I think we were pursuing during that time. I have two, uh, I have three wonderful children, uh, Michael Benjamin, uh, Lily, and Austin Reed, and two cats and two dogs. So that's me, and I hope that helps to help you understand who I am and what I'm doing. So um, if you don't mind, when we think about understanding me, uh, this is going to be really about us, me, you, us, we, uh, not so much uh, about uh, institutional or organizational or even sy systemic uh, uh, bias, uh, uh, you know, training or bias information or discussion. But we are going to spend some time uh, uh, talking about uh, me, you, and I. I will tell you, despite not having the uh, academic background as a psychologist, all of the information that I use uh, is gleaned from about, about 160 or 70 academics in the field, including Thomas Golovich, uh, renowned uh, uh, psychologist um, uh, in the area of bias, and uh, Dr. Jerry Kang, uh, who was uh, famous for uh, the 2006 uh, California Law Review on bias in the justice system. And so what you'll be getting is highly academic from a non-academic. I'm just a regular Joe out there in the community trying to help people in a positive way, in a spiritual way, with love, with understanding, and uh, trying to come to a positive uh, outcome for all. So if you don't mind, please place your name and email address into the chat box as we get started so that uh, I can communicate with you after the session is over in case you have any questions or anything that you need to communicate with me about. So thank you again, and I'll go ahead and get started. So uh, the following, uh, as I mentioned, is conducted by more than 78 scientists, psychologists, and experts in the field, specifically around implicit bias. As I mentioned, uh, I leaned heavily on kind of the California Law Review uh, because it is one of those that's generally accepted by almost everybody that is in this field. Uh, and so I thought, you know what, why not just uh, take a look at what that was from back in 2006, put it together for us in a way that helps us um, uh, put this uh, uh, presentation together. Know that there are so many types of bias uh, team that we frankly, we'll not be able to cover them all here today. I'm going to quickly go through a variety of them, and then we'll center on the ones uh, that I think that uh, apply to all of us as humans, all right? So uh, please uh, bear with me if you don't uh, see something that you were really wanting to learn a whole lot more of in a power hour. We try to crunch a lot of information into a short power hour in an effort to show you the variety of different things that are available out there, uh, implicit bias, DEI training, uh, social injustice, all of the things that we offer, we're gonna try to scrunch into here. So I'll, I'll move quickly. If I'm talking too fast, please stop me. I, I will slow down and, and uh, cover an area that maybe isn't quite so um, uh, well understood. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what our different biases are. Again, I mentioned earlier, there's so many of them that I, I really can't spend uh, too much time on them, but let me quickly go through a few of them for you. I would love for you to maybe take some notes uh, and then when we get done discussing these and defining these uh, various biases, uh, you maybe you tell me what you got out of it, okay? So here's uh, the actor observer bias. It's a tendency to attribute uh, your own actions to external causes uh, while attributing others' behaviors to internal causes. 
Here's a great example, and I'll do this for every one of these. I'll tell you what it is, and then I'll give you an example, okay? For example, you attribute your high cholesterol level to genetics. Can't be helped. Mom had it, dad had it, grandma had it, down the line of you know uh, DNA. However, you consider others to have high cholesterol due to a poor diet or a lack of exercise. So, so that helps to explain a little bit about what uh, actor observer bias is. We have anchoring bias, which is the tendency to rely too heavily on the first piece of information you learn. Uh, for example, if you learn that the average price of a car is of a certain value, you may think that the amount below that is a good deal and perhaps maybe not search for a better deal. That's really all that is. Uh, when we look at uh, attentional and confirmational bias, uh, confirmational is favoring information that conforms to you and me and our existing beliefs and discounting evidence that doesn't conform. Uh, so we have to be careful when we are uh, inundated with all of these biases, uh, because sometimes we may leave some others out that we should consider. When we talk about availability heuristic, it's placing a greater value on information that comes to your mind quickly, right away. You give greater credence to this information and tend to overestimate the probability and likelihood of similar things happening in the future. False consensus is a tendency to overestimate how much other people agree with you. And then here's one that I love. This is called fictional, I'm sorry, functional fixedness. Say that three times really quickly. This is a tendency to see objects as only working in a particular way. Uh, here's an example. If you don't have a hammer, and I have one here, and you need to put up this little beautiful family of mine behind you in preparation for this session, and you did not have this hammer, you might not get that up. And the reason you wouldn't get it up is because though you might have a really, um, oh, I don't know, wide screwdriver handle, which could easily put a small nail into that wall, you wouldn't consider it because the only thing that we use to drive nails in is a hammer. Functional fixedness means that sometimes we see a corkboard only being able to be used by thumbtacks as if that's the only thing that we could use to attach to a corkboard, or as if that's the only thing that a thumbtack is used for. Now let's take this a little further into say business where I'm in, okay? Where this could come to hurt us, could be where I have a person who's on my team who's a great customer servant, great customer service manager. I have a promotion in, upcoming in a digital space, a lot of technology. I need someone to run this IT group. There's a real possibility if I'm stuck on functional fixedness that I would not see that customer service manager as having the skills and abilities uh, available to do this other IT work, right? And so we have to be careful with functional fixedness because uh, we always ask the question ASK, right? Abilities, uh, skills, and knowledge. And when it comes to leadership, sometimes the technical skill isn't really the most important skill. Sometimes all of the other things, human resources, emotional intelligence, you know, delegation, ability to lead groups, right? Some of those things are kind of those softer skills that we look for, which would make for a great IT candidate. So functional fixedness is one of the ones that I, I uh, uh, spend a, a lot more time on as we go through this uh, presentation. So we have optimism bias. It, it, it leads you to believe that you are less likely to suffer uh, uh, from misfortune and more likely to, ex uh, to um, uh, attain success than your peers. 
we have the halo effect. That's your overall impression uh, of a person, and, and it influences how you feel about their character, uh, especially applying uh, this to, say, physical appearance. Uh, and, and certainly I'm not in that group. <laughs> but if somebody is really nice to look at, right, male or female, you know, they don't have an old scraggly beard like I do, they're you know, really well presented, nice tie when they come to the interview. We may be uh, in that uh, halo effect where, man, that gal or that guy looks great. They're going to be great for the job. Uh, but then we don't pay attention to maybe the character or maybe even the ASK that I talked about earlier today. Misinformation effect, and we have a tremendous amount of that going on now in our in our country and in our world. It's a tendency for post-event information to interfere with the memory of an original event. It's easy to have your memory influenced uh, by what you hear about an event from others. Knowledge of this effect has led to mistrust, for example, in the criminal uh, justice system, in law enforcement, a mistrust of eyewitness uh, information. I'm sure you've heard of the heard of those. So. So again, you know, uh, those are some of the basics that are out there. There's so many more, and I, I wish I had all the time in the world to, to go through them with you because they're all fascinating in and of themselves. Uh, but uh, this is what we're going to do today. We're going to spend a little time explaining what bias is. I'm not going to read each of these. You see them in front of you, but that's the goal for the day. And then ending finally with some tools and tips that we can use to hold ourselves accountable and hold others accountable. Uh, for harmful bias. Am I doing okay? Not too fast, team? Okay. Uh, so focus for today will be number one, individual bias. We will delve a little tiny bit into bias at work throughout the discussion and a little tiny bit uh, into uh, bias in the community, although those two are separate to our segments of their own. Uh, I just wanted to share that with you so that if you really wanted to learn much more, you can contact whoever you contacted to get involved with today's session. And then, uh, you know, we can work that out later. Uh, but today it's going to be about me, you, us, and we, and how we hold ourselves accountable. Consciously, we think that race discrimination is wrong, but 98% of our brain function is subconscious. And implicit bias is subconscious. We just react quickly without a lot of conscious thought. Our brains create subconscious shortcuts so that we can react quickly when we need to. And I'm sure you've heard of the uh, fight or flight uh, uh, theory. And it most definitely comes into play as we learn about our individual biases. And I will let experts explain this to you because as I mentioned, I'm not. And I think you'll get a lot out of the experts when we uh, view them here, uh, several videos that we will be watching today. Most common types, I mentioned uh, several of them as we uh, uh, described uh, each of them and gave some examples. I like to put this up because I want to make sure that we understand there's unconscious or explicit, I'm sorry, implicit, and then conscious or explicit refers to the attitudes and beliefs we have about a person or a group on a conscious level. There is science here and there is medicine and there is medical and there is psychology, brain work, body work, mind work. Uh, please uh, take a, a minute to look up uh, visiblebody.com. And you will learn that uh, we all have biases. We're okay. It's what we do with them. It's all up here. Okay. So again, just another reminder, because we're going to get into a little conversation here where I want to just make sure that that's at the top of our mind. Implicit social cognition. Attitudes and stereotypes. Keep those two in your mind as we move forward into the next session, attitudes and stereotypes. We're gonna watch uh, a video here and I'd like you to take some notes as you listen to the following video. Uh, anything that sticks out in your mind, 
uh, as you listen. Kimberly Papillon is a nationally recognized expert on medical, legal, and judicial decision making. Uh, she served as regularly faculty for the National Judicial College since 2005. She is an expert, uh, has delivered more than 3,000 lectures nationally and internationally. Uh, and specific implications of neuroscience, psychology, implicit association, the analysis of decision making in the fields of business, medicine, education, and the justice system. So I found someone who kind of just has been involved and experienced in it all. Let's take a listen, shall we? Talk about bias. People often get uncomfortable. The most difficult people to teach fairness to are people who value fairness the most. People who really care about being fair often can push away the idea that there's unconscious bias most vigorously. Talk to a group of people who aren't really in the business of valuing fairness, and you can get a lot further along because you don't have to convince them that unconscious, unconscious bias actually exists. So fair people, fair-minded people, people who care about egalitarian values, those individuals actually have the most difficulty with unconscious bias. Not so much that they are more biased, but they are less willing sometimes to accept the notion that bias exists and that we all have it. Now, what's interesting about unconscious bias is that it doesn't automatically make us bad people. What it does sometimes is make us do things that don't align with our value system. And the most intelligent people out there are best able to rationalize their decisions that are actually based on unconscious bias and make it seem as if they're based on something else. They're able to create an argument in their mind as to why they did what they did so that it doesn't look like bias was the basis. So the more education we get, the more analytical we become, the more experienced we are, the better we are in creating an illusion for ourselves that we're not biased. But bias is human. It is inherently human. It's about understanding who we are and how we react to things that we're not familiar with or that we've been taught are negative or frightening. It's our mechanism for survival, but it's antiquated. It goes way back to the time where we were walking around, perhaps in jungles, and we had just a moment to determine if someone was friend or foe. If they were friend, you could sit around and have a grunting conversation. If they were foe, you better run or fight. In a global society, that type of behavior no longer applies. We can't get along that way anymore. We have to become broader in our perspective. But we still have these antiquated notions of how to protect ourselves. And we have to let those go. Those are our unconscious biases. They no longer serve to protect. They now serve to divide. And it's what we don't want. So the first step in the program has got to be to accept that biases exist, place the guilt to the side, and work on a solution together. All right. Well, I, I hope you, like me, saw that uh, short video as explaining everything we just went through. Uh, so here's where we get a chance to use our chat interface. Uh, you know, just take a couple of minutes here and tell me what are some things that stood out uh, as you listen to uh, Dr. Papillon. Let me take a look here. Getting my chat box up. I hope everybody was able to hear her. We all have bias. Thank you, Bridget. We all have it. Yes, excellent. may not think you're biased, but consciously might be affected. Absolutely. Fair-minded people have difficulty because we think we're fair. We, we, we don't walk around, you know, intentionally doing bad things, right? And yet we have them. Excellent. Thank you, Renee. Doesn't make us bad people. In fact, without them, there's a real possibility, and this is another segment for another time, I'm happy to 
you know, instruct on that, on really from the time that we were grunting, if you will, uh, biases help to survive. Love what you just said, Dana. Put the guilt aside. Let's work on a solution. Biases sometimes are things that do not align with our value system. It is inherently human and working on a solution together. And I think you guys have nailed it. So thank you very, very much for that. Hey, let me just, let me just make it really simple because I'm a real simple guy. What do you think of this? Tell me, do you prefer coffee or tea? Either shout it out or put it in the text. I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly. All right, tea, all right. Why? Why tea? Why not coffee? Less sugar? Less cream? Ooh, lighter taste. <laughs> Never acquired a taste for coffee. You gotta try it, it's good stuff. I like both, but I don't drink coffee. Thank you, Bridget. Um, but it is a preference, is it not? It is a, a palate preference, right? Uh, it, it is a bias towards one or the other uh, and for your own particular reasons. Here's another one. They'll get, they'll get increasingly tougher here, just a second. You have small children at home. They want a dog. Tell me, would you consider this dog? I don't know, I wouldn't. Why do you think I wouldn't? Well, what are the stigmas that we know about pit bulls? Now my daughter has two of them, one, one pit bull and one boxer and they're just beautiful animals. But Renee, thank you <laughs> for being human. Um, all right, so let's move to the next one. How many of you would pick this breed and why? Look at that face. I mean, I think we can see, right? One breed is what we know to be through media and all the other stuff, ooh, dangerous. Another breed, for the same reasons, maybe even experiences in our life, maybe we had one, turned out to be really great with kids, right? And so we're making these decisions all the time. What do you think of this? You're scouting a neighborhood to potentially move into. The schools are a little older, maybe lack some basic amenities. Would you move into this community? <laughs> I love Renee's comment. Cute, but I, I'd get too much shedding. Yes. Okay, so you're thinking about that. How many of you would pick this neighborhood? based on this view of this school, a brand new school with all the amenities, looks nice, good landscaping, nice colors. It does depend on where it is for sure, Renee. And then finally, this one, tell me, if your college age daughter was about to get into a taxi or a Uber, and this is who was inside when you opened the door, would you tell her to wait until another taxi was free or would you tell her to get in and why? Let's take a moment and answer that one. I'm willing to bet most of us would say no, just based on the appearance, right? And it's when we take an action on the bias that is prejudicial or discriminatory when that is when that bias becomes harmful. This individual happens to be an elementary school teacher in Australia. Extraordinarily well loved by parents and students alike. Now he happens to have a love for artwork but there you see it. 
And uh, I thought that would be uh, good for us to just keep in the top of our mind. Sometimes the look uh, makes us behave in certain ways. So we all have biases. It's about uh, an attitude and it is human. You are biased, I am biased, and it does matter. Let's talk a little bit about how did we become biased, okay? Really it's everywhere from, really from birth uh, to old age. Implicit biases are influenced by experiences, um, cultural conditioning, uh, media portrayals, an upbringing that can all contribute uh, to, to implicit associations that people form about members of other social groups. So it's really uh, throughout our whole lifetime. And we are susceptible to bias because of these tendencies, right? I'm gonna let you um, uh, learn about uh, Dr. Thomas Golovich. He's a professor of psychology at, at Cornell University. And he says, uh, we tend to seek out patterns. Implicit bias occurs because of the brain's natural tendency to look for patterns and associations in the world. Social cognition, uh, our ability to store, process, and apply information about people in social uh, situations. Uh, it's dependent on this ability to form associations about the world. Uh, he says people evaluate the evidence of their everyday experience and make judgments. That's just who we are. He also says, we like to take shortcuts. Like our cognitive biases, implicit bias is a result of the brain's tendency to simplify the world because the brain is constantly inundated with more information that it can possibly process. We take shortcuts. It makes mental shortcuts uh, so that you can get faster and easier for the brain to sort uh, through all the data. Now, again, I keep telling you, I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not a neuroscientist, but that kind of makes sense to me. And I thought, and I hope that it makes sense to you. Experience and social conditioning also play a role. I wanna let you listen to Dr. Jerry Kang. Uh, he will put it all together, that last little segment that we just talked about, distinguished professor of law distinguished professor of Asian American studies. Uh, he too was involved and contributed to the 2006 California Law Review, where much of the discussion on uh, bias and anti-bias is uh, um, uh, taken from. Please take a few notes as you listen to the video. I hope you like it. He makes much more sense than I do. Uh, and then we'll talk about it after we watch. It'll be a few minutes, so uh, you know, bear with me. It's about 13 minutes. So I'm going to start with an impolite question. Do you discriminate on the basis of race, gender, sexual orientation? I mean, if you were the identical TED talk, but coming from a white guy, would you like it better? Of course not. Why would you do that? Uh, we all remember the dream. We remember what Martin Luther King Jr. taught us, right? He said we're supposed to judge people by the content of character, not the color of skin. You judge people only on the merits and nothing else. We're colorblind, but are you so sure? So it turns out actually some people actually are literally colorblind, so they can't see that tile A is much darker than tile B, but most of us actually can see that. But it's actually an illusion, just like a... So I'm gonna start with an impolite question. Sorry about that. Do you discriminate? on the basis of race, gender, sexual orientation. I mean, if you were the identical TED talk, but coming from a white guy, would you like it better? Of course not. Why would you do that? Uh, we all remember the dream. We remember what Martin Luther King Jr. taught us, right? He said we're supposed to judge people by the content of character, not the color of skin. You judge people only on the merits and nothing else. We're colorblind, but are you so sure? 
So it turns out actually some people actually are literally colorblind, so they can't see that tile A is much darker than tile B, but most of us actually can see that. But it's actually an illusion. Just like a smartphone camera does autofocus and autocorrect, it turns out our brains do the same thing constantly. And when we do so, we usually get things right, but sometimes the shadows and the compensation for actual contrast effects gets things wrong. It's this understanding that maybe our brains are like our powerful smartphone cameras that can actually tell us a lot about how things actually work. So think about it. The real world confronts you at a brutal pace in real time. You can't but engage in automatic processing. So when I came out on the stage, what did your brains do? You auto-focused on my face, you did some face recognition, and you immediately hashtagged me with multiple categories, male, middle-aged, professional, <laughs> Asian. And then you stored that data in a mental cloud that you keep up here with all the other things that you have stored and hashtagged as Asian over the course of your entire lives. Now, social psychology would describe that mental cloud in terms of attitudes and stereotypes. Attitudes are like gut feelings, emotional valences of positive versus negative, like versus dislike, hot versus not, thumbs up versus thumbs down. By contrast, stereotypes are like traits that you associate with the category. So you already know I'm a professional, I'm a law professor. Once you put me into the category of Asian, you might be thinking, eh, more likely than not that he got a perfect score on his math SAT. <laughs> I'm Asian. More likely than not that I have a second degree black belt in some ancient East Asian martial art. More likely than not that I was raised by a tiger mom who forced me to practice, not cello, but violin, six hours a day such that I performed at Carnegie Hall at the age of 16. Two out of those three are actually true. Um, Decades of research have told us that actually these attitudes and these stereotypes influence how you see me and how you behave. So if I want to know whether you discriminate, I actually have to get access to that mental cloud. I have to know what the junk is inside your head. Now, one way to do that is for me to just sidle up to you and ask, like, on average, sir, are African Americans more violent and criminal than white folks? Um, on average, ma'am, do you think that women just aren't as good as men in engineering and science, whether they be 12-year-olds or 40-year-olds? On average, do you think Asians are really good at technically copying things but lack the creativity that we really so desperately desire in a context such as this? When I ask these further impolite questions, I run into two veils. First, even if you have attitudes and stereotypes that you're aware of, you're not going to tell me what you really think, especially when the cameras are rolling. Like, how many beers must you have drunk before noon before you actually tell me what you think? More disturbing is that you might have implicit biases, mental associations that you're not even aware of, these filters that come from culture day in and day out. And if you're not even aware of them, you're not able to self-report even to yourselves, much less others. And there's decades, again, of social psychological research that says, in a weird way, our brains are such ridiculously complex machines that we can't just introspect and figure out what's really going on. As Timothy Wilton says, we are strangers to ourselves. So how then do we measure these implicit biases that we might not even be aware of? Do we put you under hypnosis? Do we put you under an fMRI and take brain scans? What about something simpler, like playing a video game? In order to understand, I need you to participate. The rules are very, very easy. All you have to do is run down columns one, two, and three, and as quickly as possible, ignore the letters, shout out the colors. So for column number one, you would say green, red, purple, green. I need all of you to participate. Ready, set, go. Green, red, red purple, purple green. green. Blue, yellow, blue, red. Green, yellow, red, purple. It's a TED, TED audience. I assumed it would be a little bit better. Okay, second time. Here we go. Ignore the letters. Focus only on the colors. Ready, set, go. Green, red, purple, green. Blue, yellow, blue, red. Green, yellow, red, purple. Oh, yeah, you're screaming. So third time should be the charm. Now, I want you to focus only on the colors. Be blind to the letters as if Martin Luther King Jr. implored you to do it. Ready, set, go. Green, red, purple, green. 
All right, all right. It's like being stuck in molasses in a winter January, right? So, uh, so now you get it. Now you see it. The whole point is that any two concepts that are tightly associated in our brains, we can actually pair together very quickly. So when you see the word R-E-D and the color red, we can sort them very quickly together. By contrast, when you see the word R-E-D and the color green, we hesitate. It's like our CPUs are thrashing about trying to get the right answer. We're not stupid. We're, like, we got admitted as participants in the TED Talk. Like, we should be doing this faster, but it takes a little bit longer. But that's the insight, right? That you could use the speed of sorting as a signal for how tight things are mentally associated in this cloud that we don't have access to. That is the underlying logic of the implicit association test invented by Tony Greenwald. And you sit in front of a computer and play essentially a video game. You're flashed, for example, on the standard black-white attitudinal IAT, pictures of white folks, white men, hit a key with your left hand. If you see a picture of a black man, hit a key with your right hand. We could do that, that's actually easy. When you see sometimes good words like beauty and joy, hit a key with your left hand. By contrast, when you see words like filth and sick, bad words, hit a key with your right hand. We can follow these instructions. Notice the actual arrangement. White faces and good words are on the same response key. Black faces and bad words are on the same response key. And we fly through that test. But because psychologists are devious people, sometimes randomized and counterbalanced, you get runs like this, where you get white faces and bad words on the same hand, and black faces and good words on the same hand. And then we hesitate, we stutter, we make a few more errors, we go a little bit more slowly. It's that delta in time that by definition is deemed to be a measure of your bias that you could measure, and it might be only 300 milliseconds, it might only be 200 milliseconds. But that's the test that was created. Now, if this test is just nonsense, whether you're left-handed or right-handed, whether you grew up playing Nintendo versus Xbox, what would you see if you gave this test to a lot of people? Well, you would see random noise, like a coin flip. Right? Half the people would sort good words with white faces faster, other time faster with black faces. It would just be 50-50. So think about what data has been collected. So you actually have this amazing site, Project Implicit, run by Brian Nozick, uh, Marjorie Banaji, and Tony Greenwald, both uh, professors Banaji and Greenwald I've had the great pleasure of co-authoring with, they've collected millions of IAT scores, and here's what we see. It's not 50-50. 80% of us associate good words faster with pictures of young people versus old people. 68% white over yeah, black. 68 straight over gay. 69% thin over fat. 76% abled over disabled, and 72% of us are faster to sort, to sort pictures of weapons with black male faces versus white male faces. All right, so automatic processing, we learned about from Dr. Kang. There's a lot more uh, that we talk about in the full sessions. I'll go through a few of these. The mental cloud he talked about, uh, which are attitudes and stereotypes. Remember, we talked about those earlier. The two veils, explicit for one and implicit for the other. Im implicit bias effect, that's that delta that is deemed the measure of your bias. And then he ended, uh, and you didn't get the chance to see it with immaculate perception. There is no immaculate perception. You are biased, so am I, it matters. 99.996 unconscious. I want to end uh, in the next five minutes by talking a little bit about what can happen uh, when we don't have our biases in check. And uh, I can tell you that uh, bad things happen, right? Uh, you can see here George Floyd who died on May 25th, 2020, was a black American man killed during an arrest after allegedly passing a counterfeit $20 bill in Minneapolis. Bad things happen. Let's listen to law enforcement tell us that themselves. There is this sense that police officers, white and black, frankly, view black males, black teenage males as a threat. The concern and the perception is real. I will say that. Uh, 
Because historically, if you look back, there has always been tension between minority communities and law enforcement. Now, I'm not saying that police officers are racist by nature, but the situation can enhance biases after you're here on the job. Why is that? Well, if you're a police officer and you work in certain neighborhoods, certain communities, and the people that you are arresting look a certain way, behave a certain way, it, it, it's easy for someone to get stereotyped. Listen, I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear you acknowledge that. There is this sense. Perception, situational, and context. That's what we heard from that law enforcement officer. Too often what we see is this, especially today. What we don't see enough of is this, or this. And this, uh, this is what's wrong with uh, uh, biases and not understanding them. When we don't understand our biases, there's a tendency for us to do things with them that are harmful. I will tell you that um, I'm going to leave you with this. I hope you give me about three more minutes after 20 We have noon. been practicing This is uh, Brian silence. Stevenson. He says we tolerate bias and inequality. We have a variety of tools available to help us navigate this, understand ourselves. And uh, I'm going to end the session by letting you listen to, uh, to Brian Stevenson, uh, the author of Just Mercy. It's a movie that's out there on Netflix. I would highly encourage you to watch it. We have been practicing uh, silence about our history for a very long time. In this country, we don't talk about slavery. We don't talk about lynching. We don't talk about segregation. We have a hard time talking about race. Uh, and it has burdened us. We don't think it's odd that we don't talk about this history. We actually think it's odd when somebody tries to talk about it. If we react to the effort of trying to talk about it as if that's the threat, not our continued silence. We're doing a lot of damage. Uh, to each succeeding generation. Uh, it's the 21st century, and there's still a presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to black and brown people in this country. We haven't created spaces in America that deal honestly with the legacy of slavery. You know, my view is that the great evil of American slavery wasn't involuntary servitude and forced labor. It was the narrative of racial difference that we created to justify it. We said black people are different than white people. They can't do this, they can't do that. The Supreme Court said they're three-fifths human. And this ideology of white supremacy, that narrative of racial difference, that was the true evil. So for me, slavery doesn't end in 1865, it just evolves. It turns into decades where we have terrorism and lynching and our courts and our systems of government tolerated black people being pulled out of their homes and hung from trees, sometimes on the courthouse lawn. The legal system, the rule of law was complicit. The black people in Boston, the black people in Cleveland and Chicago and Detroit and Los Angeles and Oakland didn't go to those communities as immigrants looking for new economic opportunities. They went there as refugees and exiles from terror in the American South. We tolerate bias and injustice. That's what uh, Brian Stevenson says. So what do we do? Commit to one action. Even some of the best experts out there will tell you when you do too much or try to do too much, nothing gets done, right? You've heard the old saying, when everything's a priority, then nothing is a priority. Here's something I'd like to share with you. Go to implicit bias uh, and take a bias test on your own. Take it now, take it three months from now, and take it six months from now. And you'll find some things that are helpful in understanding your individual bias. Hold yourself accountable, question impressions, 
ask for feedback and hold others accountable. Demand that people explain themselves when they behave and or say in ways that are obviously discriminatory or prejudicial. And finally, empower everyone to call out unconscious bias. I wanna thank you for the time that you have spent here with me today. I know it went by very, very fast. There's a tremendous amount of uh, work that has gone into this, uh, both here uh, where we are today. And if you want to learn more, we have a wide variety, a uh, breadth of information and instruction and presentation uh, to help us all uh, get better informed on how we can improve our uh, world today through understanding our biases uh, and understanding how they affect the world around us. So again, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, and let's see here a couple moments. Oh yes, so Bridget, you did see the movie. Excellent, excellent. Oh my gosh, thank you guys so much for everything. Uh, you have your emails in there. If you need anything from me, please, uh, shoot me an email and uh, I'll see what I can do for you. Thanks again, everybody, for your time. Have a great rest of your day.